Welcome back to the UW Student Seminars, guys. Uh, so today I'll be doing my talk. Uh, my name is Feng Yang, by the way. I'll be doing my talk on constructive analysis. Um, so I'm a third year uh, combinatorics and optimization and pure math student at University of Waterloo. And the reason I picked constructive analysis, it seemed like a different kind of approach to analysis. That's not necessarily um, any harder than what what you would do in a first year calculus or analysis course, like 147, but it's sort of a different approach. So roughly in this talk, what we'll do is we'll go over what the idea behind constructive analysis is, what's the main idea, why do we do it, what's the point. Um, we'll talk about uh, the logic behind it. So in particular, um, we are, we're going to use a different kind of logic than what you might be used to, uh, intuitionistic logic. And then I'll go over, uh, of course, the construction of the real numbers, because that's the main focus of analysis, is things that look like the real numbers. Um, so we'll go over a construction of the real numbers and some properties. Perfect. So uh, before I start, and there's a theorem on the board, before I start, let me go over the idea behind constructive analysis. So what does constructive mean in mathematics? Uh, to, to put it, you know, in a sort of informal understanding of constructive, whenever you have a proof and this proof gives you an algorithm, then that's a constructive proof. So what I mean by an algorithm is some steps that a human or a computer or something else can actually execute. So the theorem on the board is, is sort of a good example of that. What do I mean by an algorithm? How can we have an algorithm for something uh, like math? Well, so here is a theorem. Uh, what I'm saying is that it's possible for an irrational number raised to an irrational power to be rational, right? So it's not the case that uh, an irrational number to an irrational power is always irrational. So I, I, in particular, I'm saying that there is some a and b that are irrational, so that a to the power of b is actually rational. What a constructive approach to this problem would be is it would give you an algorithm that lets you construct A and B. So you might be curious, like, what kind of proof would not give you an algorithm? You know, most proofs are themselves lists of steps. Algorithms are lists of steps. What kind of proof might not give you a list of steps? And uh, it seems natural that we would want a list of steps whenever possible so that we can turn these math proofs into things that are useful for applications. Oops. So here's a proof. I don't know if you guys can see this. It's a lot smaller than I imagined. Is it visible? OK. So this proof is <clears throat> very simple. Uh, the idea is you know, we, we, we look at root 2 raised to the power of root 2, and we say two cases, right? Root 2 to the power of root 2 is a real number. So it's either a rational number or it's an irrational number. If it's rational, then actually we're done. Uh, because root 2, we know, is not rational. And we found a and b to be root 2. And that gives you uh, root 2 to the power of root 2 is a rational number, is a rational number. So we're done. Now in the other case, so let's say root 2 to the root 2 was not rational. Then actually we can pick a to be root 2 and b to be root 2 to the power of root 2. So why can we pick b to be root 2 to the power of root 2? Because we made the assumption that that is irrational. So we found two irrational numbers. Now, if you look at a to the power of b, of course, that's root 2 to the power of root 2 to the power of root 2. Uh, exponent laws give you that that's equal to 2. 2 is rational. So actually, in either case, regardless of whether root 2 to the power of root 2 was rational or otherwise, we found some a and b that work. Now, this proof is an example of a non-constructive proof. Yeah? I think you have to flip a and b. Is it, wouldn't it be root 2 to the root 2 to the root 2? Uh, yeah, that, that, that is correct. Uh, should be b to the power of a. So it's a typo. Um, of course, it doesn't really change the essence of the proof. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Um, the exponent laws are a little inverted in this one. So this is an example of a non-constructive proof. Why is it non-constructive? Well, if we tried to turn this into a list of steps to get our a and b, how would we figure out a and b? Well, the first step is we need to decide whether root 2 to the power of root 2 is rational. And who can tell me whether root 2 to the root 2 is rational? Maybe some of you can tell me, but 
Did I give enough information? Yes, David? Uh, yes, there are techniques that give you that this is actually not a rational number. Uh, but Yes, Galfon Schneider, I think, is the right one. Yes, there are such techniques. Did I present to you a list of steps for determining whether root 2 to root 2 was rational? In this proof, no. So you cannot turn this proof into an algorithm. And we'll, 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 we'll look at that more concretely uh, very soon. But first, I'll give a, a different proof, right? This is a very similar proof. Um, but I mean, we're not making any decisions here. We're just saying let A is root 2 and B is the base 2 log of 9. Okay? That's reasonable enough. So if you do the computation, root 2 to the base 2 log of 9 is actually the square root of 2 to the base 2 log of 9. And that's actually root 9, which is 3. And we know that 3 is rational. So we just need that root 2 is irrational, which is quite easy to show, and also that the base 2 log of 9 is irrational, which is also fairly easy to show. So this gives us a constructive proof of the, the theorem, that it's possible for two irrational numbers to give a rational number um, when you put them in a power. And this is constructive because there are algorithms that can compute root 2 to whatever precision you like, and similarly with log 9 by log 2, right? the base 2 log of 9. So those are numbers that we can actually write an algorithm. And I, I've omitted the list of steps, of course. I've just used this notation. But inherent in the notation is some way to calculate that thing. And that's the essence of constructive mathematics, is we sort of restrict ourselves a little bit and focus on parts of mathematics that we can turn into algorithms. We don't ignore the algorithms in the proof, but rather it becomes you know, inherent in the proof. So then we can actually extract the algorithms from the proof. And that's actually something called witness extraction, which is, which is fairly popular nowadays because it has a lot of applications to computer science, uh, finding algorithms that actually um, solve some of the things that mathematics tells you should be solvable. So let's go back to the first proof. And I'm going to try to implement it. And it's always fun to write an implementation of uh, a proof, right? <clears throat> well, so what the first proof is asking you is, OK, first tell me whether root 2 to the power of root 2 is rational or not. And if so, you can compute the a and b this way. Otherwise, you can compute the a and b this way. Right? This is very reasonable. This is an algorithm. So why doesn't this algorithm work? Well, if, you are, uh, if you've done computer science before, you'd probably realize these steps are fine. Your computer can calculate root 2, in fact, to any precision you want. The problem is if you tell your computer to decide whether root 2 to the power of root 2 is a rational number or not, it will not be able to do that unless you have like Mathematica or something and it has an algorithm for that. Most computers, unless you tell it how to do it, can't do that. So this proof wasn't constructive because you made a decision. right? You made this decision, which requires you to know whether root 2 to the power of root 2 is rational or not. And in classical mathematics and non-constructive mathematics, we sort of hand wave that away. We, we, we write, you know, the law of the excluded middle, we say either something, something is true or it's not true, right? In logical notation, uh, we either have something is true or we have the opposite is true. So in non-constructive mathematics, this is an axiom. It's the law of the excluded middle. There's no third option. But if you try to put this axiom into your computer, what you get is sort of like, some oracle, right? If your computer could solve this axiom and say, for any p, p or not p, and you put that in an if statement to do your proof by cases, that would imply your computer has the ability to decide anything, right? That's like sort of a total omniscience in some sense, right? We know everything. Then we can use this in an algorithm. So if our computer knows everything, we can use this root 2 to the power of root 2 in q or not in our algorithm you might have guessed that this is probably not the case with at least our understanding of computation doesn't include being able to understand everything, right? Being able to know anything. So this implies that we need to fix logic itself. If we want to construct mathematics in a way that everything has an algorithm, it's not enough to 
change some theorems around, change some definitions around, we actually have to change the way we do logic. Because in classical logic, we have this law of the excluded middle, and we can't have that in constructive mathematics. So there's a famous um, other kind of logic called intuitionistic logic. And that, uh, one, one example of that is the brouwer hating komogorov interpretation, the BHK interpretation. So what it does is it sort of redefines logic, right? It redefines what these logical connectives that you might be used to from your first year Math 135 course, it redefines what they mean in some sense um, so that it's amenable to constructive proofs. So the first two um, connectives are fairly straightforward, right? If I have some statement A, some statement B, I can connect them with AND or OR. And this is the same as in classical mathematics, except there's a little bit of a nuance here. A proof of A and B, the statement, is a proof of A and a proof of B. So that means if you have a proof of A and B, you can give me two parts of it, the part that's a proof of A and the part that's a proof of B. And that's fair. The second part, a proof of A or B, is a proof of A or a proof of B. And it also sounds very straightforward. But this has some nuance that classical mathematics sort of hand waves away. And if I have a proof of A or B, that's actually a proof of A, or it's actually a proof of B. It's not a proof of the combined statement without proving one of the disjuncts, right? So in a disjunction, like say P or not P, if I have a proof of this, it must be either a proof of P itself, or it's a proof of not P. It can't be you know, a proof of this thing out of thin air, or you know, as an axiom. We cannot take P or not P to be an axiom unless we're assuming that everything has a proof, right? Everything has a proof that we, we, ha we can find a proof for everything, which means you know, total omniscience. And so in the constructive BHK interpretation, we have to be careful that proving a disjunction you have to actually prove one of the disjuncts so you can decide in, in the future which, which branch to take, right? You have to know what kind of thing you're proving so that you can use it, the proof. So for all, and there exist, um, these predicates are sort of generalizations of and and or to arbitrarily many objects, right? At least they can be thought of in that sense. If I have for all x some proposition for x, it's the same as saying, you know, the proposition is true for x, it's true for y, it's true for z, etc. You know, true for everything in, in whatever set, in whatever universe I'm talking about. So this, in similar sense, a proof of for all x, uh, some proposition for x, it's some algorithm that you give it an x and it will create a proof of the proposition for x. Right? If I say, you know, for all natural numbers, there's a successor, then you know, I can give it a natural number and can create a proof that there is a successor, possibly by just giving me back the successor, the next number. So that's fairly straightforward, and really it's the same as in classical logic, uh, except that we demand that it's an algorithm. In classical logic, we don't really think too much about whether our proof is an algorithm or otherwise. But luckily, in constructive mathematics, you also don't really have to think about it, because all your proofs will be algorithms if you use the, the BHK interpretation. Now, a proof of there exists x, um, such a proposition holds for x, this is different than in classical logic. In classical logic, you can prove this without actually telling me what x is. In fact, we did an example of that earlier. In classical logic, we prove there exists a and b irrational with a to the power of b rational, but we actually didn't give such an a and b, right? Those, we, we just proved their existence. It's a so-called existential proof, but it's an existential proof where we don't actually have the thing that exists. So in constructive mathematics, you might imagine we don't allow those. We require that a proof of their exists x, p of x, to have some witness. Think of a witness to a crime scene, some actual physical object that we can construct that tells us that p of x holds for that object. So we actually need such an x. It's, it's not just an existential proof. Uh, it needs a witness. Finally, 
This is fairly straightforward and not very different from classical logic. If I have A implies B, to prove that, I just create an algorithm that takes any proof of A and gives me back a proof of B. And that's fairly similar to classical logic, how you would prove an implication. You sort of assume whatever you have uh, in the hypothesis, and you plop out the conclusion. So the same idea here, except we, 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 we make more explicit the idea that we're creating these algorithms. And a proof of not A, um, so we also call that a refutation of A. That's the same thing as you give me a proof of A, and my algorithm generates some contradiction. So what's a contradiction? Something we know is false, like 1 equals 0. It's a contradiction. So if you, if you have a hypothetical proof of not A, my algorithm will be able to create some falsity from that. So that's a refutation of A. It's evidence that A is not, not the case, because we would create something false from A. So this you have to be careful about, because the double negative doesn't necessarily imply um, the positive, right? I can refute the idea of having a refutation of A in constructive logic, but that doesn't mean that I actually constructed A itself, right? For example, I can say, you know, there is no possible refutation that there exists something whatever. And in classical logic, that would mean there actually does exist that whatever. But we can't do that in constructive logic because we don't actually have a witness. All we said is there's no possible way to prove that there isn't something. But it doesn't tell us that there is actually something because it doesn't give us what that something is. So that we have to be careful to not um, conflate the double negative with the positive. So the question sort of becomes, um, we have all of these, this new logic, the BHK interpretation. What's different, right? Because we don't want to redo all of analysis. We don't want to say, OK, we're going to construct the real numbers in a totally different way. All of the theorems that we know about the real numbers are just going to throw out. Because actually, it turns out most of mathematics is constructive, right? Most of mathematics can be turned into algorithms. And we, we therefore, we want to sort of have some idea of what changes, right? What's the difference between classical math and constructive math? We don't want to sort of start from scratch. So in order to, to do this, we have to sort of get some sense of what's, what actually cannot be proven constructively. Right? We need to have some measurement of, OK, here's a statement. I can't prove this constructively, and here's why. And that's different from saying you know, proving it's false constructively. Because it turns out, you know, the BHK interpretation at least, it, it, it's, it's a strictly weaker interpretation than classical mathematics in the sense that we don't assume anything extra. So anything you can prove in constructive math is still true in regular math. It's not that we can prove this false. It's just that we don't necessarily able to prove it true. So we want to have some idea of what things are not constructive, what statements we can't find a constructive proof for. So here are some ways to measure it. There are these so-called principles of omniscience. That's when you think of taking a proof, turning it into an algorithm, at what point does your algorithm need to know an infinite number of things? Because we know that algorithms can't know an infinite number of things. There's not an infinite amount of memory. So let's, let's talk about this one first. So the first principle of omniscience is you know, total omniscience of everything, which is the law of the excluded middle. This one is much weaker. It tells us that if we have uh, binary sequence, right? There is an algorithm that can determine whether the sequence is all zeros. So everything in that sequence is a zero, or there's a one in the binary sequence, and it will find that one. So constructively, we have to interpret it as you know, actually finding that needle in the haystack. So you have an infinitely tall haystack, and you want an algorithm that can go through this haystack and tell you there are no needles, or it will tell you there's a needle. And you can imagine why this requires knowing an infinite number of things. If we try to make such an algorithm, we scan through the haystack, we wouldn't know when to stop. So we can't do this with an algorithm. So it's, it requires knowing infinite amount of information. Here's another variant on that. And this, don't, don't look at the formal-ish statement, because it's very ugly. 
Um, but the idea is very simple. You have some binary sequence. You know it has at most one, one inside the binary sequence. So you know, I have some binary sequence. It's like 0, 0, 0, whatever. And I know that in this sequence, there's not more than one, one. There's could only be at most one, one. There could be no ones, or there could be only one, one. Then what this principle tells us is, well, either all the odd terms are 0, or all the even terms are 0. Right? That sounds reasonable enough, classically. There's at most one, one among both even and odd sequences. So how can it be the case that you know, neither of them are 0? Well, it can't be the case that neither of them are 0. But is that the same thing constructively as saying one of them is 0? Right? The, because the, in this case, the disjunct is saying, well, we have an algorithm that can actually tell us the odd numbers are all 0, or the even numbers are all 0. So imagine you have two infinitely tall haystacks. And there's at most one needle among them both. How could you design an algorithm that says the le left haystack has no needles, or it says the right haystack has no needles? And it, this is also not possible, right? We can, we can design an algorithm to stop when we see a needle. But what if we never see a needle? We wouldn't know when to stop. So yeah, this is uh, a slightly less powerful, but still, it's a form of omniscience. This one is called the Markov principle. And actually, this one is even simpler. I'm just saying that if a haystack can't have no needles, right? it's not the case that this haystack has no needles. You have an infinitely tall haystack. I tell you, it's not the case that there are no needles in it. Find me a needle. And that seems like we can actually write an algorithm for it. Right? We can just go through the haystack. Once we see a needle, we terminate. And so this is actually interesting, because the Markov principle uh, actually illustrates the difference between constructive meta logic and classical meta logic. If you work constructively, you actually can't prove that such an algorithm can't terminate. If you try to t tell me, OK, this algorithm will terminate, then you should be able to identify, at least constructively, you should be able to identify some witness, right? Some number amount of time after which your algorithm would have halted. And that's not possible because you don't know how much time it would take. So this is not true constructively as long as we're working within a constructive framework. Well, it's not provable constructively if we're working in a constructive framework. Of course, in a classical framework, we can actually construct an algorithm. So the idea behind these principles is that they let us come up with these so-called Browerian counterexamples. And that means we have some proposition. And we say that, actually, if this proposition is true, then the law of excluded middle holds. Or we say, then the lesser limited principle of omniscience holds. Or even the Markov principle holds. If we can say that, that's evidence that the statement cannot be proven within our constructive framework. Because it would imply we have some form of omniscience. OK, so we have enough information now to construct the real numbers. And actually, the real numbers are constructed in a very simple way. Uh, this is, so I'm, you, I'm using the construction of bridges and uh, Vitsa, I think. I, I, I'm very bad at pronouncing Romanian names. But uh, I'm using the construction of bridges and Vitsa, which is a very simple one. Of course, everyone has their own construction. Everyone and their pet dog has their own pet construction of the real numbers. So, this is by no means standard. Uh, but it's very simple, so I'll go over it. The idea is very simple. We define a real number to be a set of intervals that approximate it. And these intervals are rational intervals. So for example, uh, we can define something like the real number 2 is a set of the interval 2 comma 2, right? It's a set of rational intervals that approximates 2. Uh, we can define, for example, the real number pi can be a set of intervals. Uh, so the first interval might be 3, comma 4. We might then have 3.1, comma 3.2, et cetera, for a decimal expansion of pi. So a real number is a set of rational intervals that sort of box it in. And we don't have real numbers to, to work with here, so the definition looks more complicated than, it's, than it is. What it's saying is some set of rational intervals so that all the intervals have to inter intersect somewhere. There can't be two intervals that disagree 
as to where the real number is. So we can't have you know, 3, 4, 6, 7, because that would imply we have two intervals that are disagreeing to where pi is. So all the real intervals have to agree somewhere. And furthermore, the intervals have to get arbitrarily small. So whatever rational epsilon we pick, we can find some interval smaller than epsilon. So the real number is just defined as some set of intervals that approximate it as closely as we want. So we need an equivalence relation, because there are multiple ways to express the same real number here, right? Uh, 2 is this interval, 2 comma 2. It's also the interval you know, 1 comma 3, you know, 1 half comma 2 and a half, uh, et cetera. So the equivalence relation is actually fairly natural. If all of the intervals from x agree with all the intervals in y, so if a particular interval of x, say x is between here and here, and any particular interval of y says y is between here and here, and any pair of such intervals, they have to overlap somewhere, then they're the same real number. right? If the intervals all agree, then it's the same. They're equal. Yeah? So how would you do this constructively? Can you do that? This is constructive. How? So this is just Did a definition. Just like a haystack thing? No. Uh, because these are sets, right? We, we, we make no claim that the sets are enumerable. We make no claim that they're even countable. We're not actually looking through the sets and saying that they're, uh, you know. Give me two, two real numbers, two sets. Right, so, so I think what you're saying is, is there an algorithm that tells me whether x equal y? Yeah. And that's no. There is no such algorithm that tells you x equal y. And we'll get to that. But eventually, essentially, it's the same as saying, can you say x equal y or x is not equal y? And the answer is, that's not provable. Right? We can define equality this way, but we don't necessarily define a decidable uh, relation. We don't necessarily define something that an algorithm can tell us uh, whether two real numbers are equal. So actually, uh, this is another uh, thing that's interesting. Um, in classical logic, of course, we say that not not x equal y means that x is equal to y. But this statement here, you know, if it's not the case that there is a refutation to x equals y, then actually x is equal to y. Not, not necessarily provable in constructive analysis. And the counterexample is the Markov principle. So the idea is you take this, and you can actually show the Markov principle. And it's a fairly straightforward exercise. Um, what you do is you consider binary representations of real numbers and can quickly uh, obtain the Markov principle. So this inequality, uh, we can call the denial inequality. And it's actually a very weak inequality. The, the fact that x is you know, not x is equal to y is a very weak inequality. So this is called the denial inequality. And often we like to work with stronger inequalities. So we won't call this by x not equal to y. Because this, this is actually very weak. It doesn't give us any indication that they're different. It just tells us they can't be equal. Ooh, skip the slide. OK, ordering is very simple, based on the exact same principle. If we have two real numbers, OK, let's go over the first one first. So x is less than y if the, there, there exists some intervals that don't overlap, and the interval enclosing x is before the interval enclosing y. So imagine a number line. Uh, x might be here, y might be here. Actually, I'm going to do x greater than y, I guess. If we have some interval enclosing x, some interval enclosing y that don't overlap, and this one is after that one, then of course x is greater than y. Or we can write y is less than x. x is less than or equal to y uh, if any pair of these intervals you know, um, so I guess y is less than or equal to x. If for any pair of intervals, you always have the beginning of this interval is before the ending of that interval. So if there's a, they don't necessarily have to overlap, but they can't be separated in the other direction. right? So y is less than or equal to x whenever this interval can't be entirely after the other interval for any pair. So these definitions are sort of based on the intuitive ones. We have all these intervals bracketing our real number to closer and closer position. If any two of them are separated, then real numbers are separated. If any two of them are, well, if all, all pairs 
are like not separated in a particular direction, we have the non-strict inequality in the other direction. Also, some, some authors advise saying at least x at least y instead of x is less than or equal to y, because this is actually not the same as x is less than y or x is equal to y, which is uh, the same in classical mathematics, but not the case in constructive mathematics. And actually, uh, that's, the, that's the first part here. In classical logic, of course, if x is at least 0, then either x is bigger than 0 or x is, uh, that should say equal 0, sorry. It's a typo on the slide. Either x is bigger than 0 or x is equal to 0. That's uh, equivalent to LPO in the constructive framework. So if you take that, you can actually prove the limited principle of omniscience. Um, and the same idea holds you take binary sequences. And actually, it makes a lot of sense if you think about it, about it um, this way. If you think of uh, defining a real number uh, with some conjecture, like the Goldbach conjecture, define a real number uh, with a bunch of intervals, and those intervals enclose 0 if all the natural numbers below that satisfy the Goldbach conjecture, then everything's fine, right? And if you don't define an interval that way, uh, so if you define an interval that way, you can easily show that this thing is at least 0, because it encloses only 1s and zeros. But if you, if you want to ask, is this actually 0 or is it not 0, you have to actually decide that unsolved conjecture. So you know, if this was constructive, you'd have some algorithm that can decide any integer conjecture, which sounds very, very powerful but doesn't exist. Uh, and of course, um, greater than or equal to 0 or less than or equal to 0, that's LLPO. So also uh, Browerian counterexample. And the same idea holds. Most of these, you look at binary sequences. OK, um, I'm going to wrap up in uh, a few minutes. But one last topic for today is, wh why are these real numbers? Right. All I've shown is that these are some sort of rational approximations to things. Uh, the distinctive feature of the real numbers is that they're complete. And I want to show com uh, completeness of the real numbers. So for those of you who've seen Math 146, uh, 147, Math 148, these definitions should look very familiar. Um, a sequence converges to a limit if, that, if it gets arbitrarily close to that limit point. right? eventually gets arbitrarily close to that limit point and stays there. A sequence is Cauchy if it gets arbitrarily close to itself and stays there. Um, and these are the same definitions as in classical mathematics. So here is uh, a theorem. And the informal statement is that you know, any Cauchy sequence converges. Any Cauchy sequence has a limit in the real numbers. And this is you know, the standard Cauchy completeness of the reals. Uh, and that intuitively means there are no holes. If you have a bunch of real numbers, there are no gaps uh, between them. Any Cauchy sequence, any sequence that gets very, very close to itself, gets close to something. And sorry I'm speeding through this, but um, actually proving this is very straightforward. And we'll prove it constructively uh, and show that the constructive real numbers are actually complete. Um, so first of all, this is a very simple lemma. It's very straightforward. If you have a positive real number, there's some positive integer that is bigger than a reciprocal of. And how can, we, how can we solve this constructively? Well, take some interval that doesn't contain 0. Why does that interval exist? Because the definition of positive means there's some inter interval that separates it from 0. So if you take that interval, you can take some n bigger than 1 by q, and we're done n bigger than the lower half of that interval. Now this is uh, the proof of the original um, theorem. And I'll go over it. Yes? When you say take, uh, what, what do you say? Can you go back? Yeah. You said take, yeah, take an interval. How can you take that? Uh, because the definition of x greater than 0 is that there exists such an interval. Yeah, but it doesn't mean you can take such an if, ex if there exists such an interval, that means you can take it, because exists Existentials in constructive math have witnesses. Oh, yeah. By definition. Yeah. By definition of greater than, there exists such an interval. So, if we have a Cauchy sequence of real numbers, um, I'm going to use uh, what's called the principle of dependent choice 
which is a weaker form of the axiom of choice. Uh, and that, that sort of lets us, you know, in a predicative way, in a constructive way, sort of construct these infinite functions. And we can say we construct the functions because we can actually compute them at every step. Um, so it's much uh, more amenable to constructive math than in uh, the, the regular axiom of choice, which implies the law of the excluded middle. So we, we use that to get this integer function. So we just map each k to nk so that uh, past the point of nk, the sequence gets to within 2 to the negative k of itself. So the sequence, you know, imagine you have some sequence. And it oscillates a little, but eventually it gets very close. We pick some nk so that the sequence always stays within 2 to the k of itself past that nk, right? And that's from the definition of Cauchy. And we do that for each k. So then we can construct this sequence of intervals that uh, are smaller than that width, right? For each, for each real number, uh, we construct uh, these intervals. So that's guaranteed because the real numbers are arbitrarily closely approximated by rationals. Then we consider this, um, the bounds of those uh, previous intervals, but we just sh shift them a little bit. So, you know, we took all of these um, thingamabobs and we, we made intervals around them that are within 2 to the negative k, and now we're going to shift those intervals by plus or minus 2 to the negative k. You know, uh, so rk becomes qk minus 2 to the negative k, r prime k becomes q prime k plus 2 to the negative k. So actually, we can come up with this bound. We can bound uh, every xn for n bigger than nk by this rk and uh, r prime k. Let's just say r prime k. Sorry for a typo. So actually, that means that every xn sub j is part of the uh, intersection of these intervals, rj, r prime j, and rk, r prime k, right? Because it's part of this one due to that statement. So we've constructed these intervals, and we can now use these intervals to define a real number, because a real number is a set of intervals. And these intervals, uh, they all agree because of this statement. They all overlap at least somewhere. And therefore, this x infinity, which we define by these intervals, is actually real. So we're almost done. All of the xn's are in these intervals, right? So that what that tells us is that we can actually get xn minus x to the infinity bracketed between uh, that interval. Because x to the infinity is in that interval, and x to the n is in that interval. So that interval gives us an explicit bound, or in this case, 2 to the minus k plus 2, on the difference from x sub n to x sub infinity. And that explicit bound shows that it converges, right? Because that thing is arbitrarily small. And uh, why is it arbitrarily small? We use the lemma. Uh, the lemma tells us there's always some 1 over n that bounds any real epsilon. And we can always bound 1 over n rationally by this 2 to the minus k plus 1. So we're done. So I'll finish off with a joke. Uh, it was proven by Cantor that a good math joke exists. Unfortunately, his proof was entirely non-constructive. Thank you very much for listening. I uh, hope you enjoyed the talk.